steps towards making sure that everyone who's attending has a really great understanding of some of the aspects of generative AI, both from the technological perspective and also just how people are talking about this from a policy perspective, and where everyone can be operating off of a common framework. Artificial intelligence, as we describe it, is a set of technologies. It's a term that's been used for a long time to describe a whole bunch of different things. But roughly, they are technologies that are designed to emulate some elements of human intelligence. And when we think about generative AI, there are lots of different types of technologies. Recently, AI has trended more toward the machine learning approach to these technologies. And within that machine learning umbrella, there are a suite of tools and capabilities that have been developed for generative AI. What is generative AI? It is AI, it is this tool for emulating human intelligence or human behavior that is really around producing content rather than processing other information. So producing content could mean producing text, images, audio. There are so many different things that people are doing now with these generative tools, but ultimately it is a, a kind of bucket term to describe a bunch of different approaches for creating tools that emulate people's ability to generate new content. You know, modern artificial intelligence, so you, you can think of AI as like a big box, right? I'm gonna try some more metaphors and stuff. But you can think of AI as like a big box, right? The Pong paddle, the other Pong paddle, that still counts as AI. Mario 1, the little guy, you know, your Goombas running around, that's AI. And then you get into machine learning, which to some extent is where data writes a little bit of the code. Right, like as it's going through the processes, it's no longer just a decision tree, there's at least some probabilistic element that emerges as a function of employing the data. And deep learning just takes that to like another level of abstraction, and I'll explain to you what uh, I mean by this, right? So uh, there are two parts of artificial intelligence, there's training and inferencing. And when you hear people talking about like needing hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, some people to do their stuff, you know, and, and honestly, why you see the massive fundraising of the generative companies, because there is the need to have all these gigantic computers for the training aspect. The inferencing aspect, that can happen on like a Raspberry Pi these days. People will continue to make the function of like using it in an instance more and more uh, like accessible and doable. So the way this, you can think about this is, think about crossing the street. You have these kind of you know, factors about what makes you go or not. Right? Some are obvious, the cross sign, some are kind of random, you can feel the car coming, or there's some strange, you know, some edge cases that come up. And by the time you're probably, I don't know, 14, you no longer just do anything really stupid while trying to cross the street, you know? I, I'm just assuming based on my own age and how stupid I was. Um, and so that, right, is the training process. The processing of all that information over your life and just some kind of abstract probability of when you should cross the street, that's the training process. Inferencing is the next time you walk up to the street corner. Um, so in terms of generative AI, I think I will stick to talking about the specific types of AI that we develop at OpenAI. And I think the analogy we like to, to make is that you can think of, of at least our tools as really fancy autocompletes. They're in some ways very similar to what happens when you are typing your email and something pops up or you're typing a text message and something pops up. It just turns out that if you do that with a lot of data and a lot of compute, you get a lot of interesting capabilities. But the reason we like to talk about it in that way is because I think what's important is having enough of an understanding of how the technology works to know what it can and can't do, what it's good at and what it's not good at. And so when you think about the process of how models are trained where you take a lot of information, a lot of that information's from the internet, and the way it builds sort of a, a picture of the world that, that um, sort of makes statistical relationships between what it, uh, the types of data is exposed to, then you will have a better understanding of why, for example, uh, the models are prone to provide inaccurate information uh, sometimes, and sort of that can inform how you interact with the models. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think that's a useful framework for at least <laughs> beginning to think about the inner workings of generative AI and then how that's directly relevant to how you can think about it from a policy perspective or from a usage perspective.
just explore uh, expressing ideas in different ways. I think that that's really exciting. For me, that's probably the most useful thing just because I am a person who uh, really likes to work in conversation with other people and um, occasionally they're not available to give me feedback on my drafts so I can short circuit that process a little bit. Um, I think from the image and other media um, creation perspective, there's a really interesting frame on this work too. I know that, and I'm sure we're gonna talk a lot about um, some of the concerns around uh, kind of IP and rights and all these things, but I also think that it's really valuable to recognize that these are tools that allow people to fill in the blank, right? These are tools that allow people to create images. These are tools that allow people to generate text. And so for me, I think that there have been many tools throughout history that uh, people have been worried about uh, kind of uh, disrupting or devaluing uh, the skill associated with a particular trade or task. And I also see there being really interesting conversations to be had around accessibility and the ways in which, you know, things being harder for a lot of people isn't necessarily a good thing. And so for me, what has me most excited is people who are exploring um, these tools as a capability enhancement to folks and making it a resource that can make certain activities more accessible for people. Um, I know that we'll get into as well some of the potential risks of disrupting tasks and work in that way as well. Actually, if I can add one thing. One thing that I love about it the most is that it gets rid of the layer of like bullshit esoterica that's kind of on top of everything, right? Because there's a certain level of, hey, these are just terms. I use a bunch of acronyms. There's like certain steps to communicating about a certain thing that's a gatekeeping aspect. Right? It's just like, if you do not know how to fill out this outline this way, you cannot participate. If you do not know how to say what a KPI is, you cannot participate, you know? And I think a lot of that is kind of like a relic, much like I think suits are a relic. And so I think we should move, like if we are going to actually make societal improvements, and if we are actually going to rethink what our lives and the lives of our neighbors and children and families and all the things you say to get people emotionally engaged, right, are gonna look like, then I think we have to not start from we should keep doing it the same way or anything that removes that barrier is bad or it's not meaningful to do that because it is meaningful right by itself it's meaningful to be able to cut through at least one to two layers of you can't do this Alec? Uh, I, I agree with a lot of what they said I think it is very clear that there are a lot of things that these tools can do that are productivity answers in in like a very obvious sense. They allow you to do something that you're currently doing faster and we are uh, fully supportive of that. We think that's very important. I think there's another way to look at it too, which is also um, something we're very interested in, which is seeing all the new and novel and interesting ways that people can make use of these tools that sort of shift how we think about things. And I can give like a specific example do I think this is the most important example? No, but it, it's just something that I find fascinating. And that is this idea that, uh, let's say I'm facing a dilemma. I don't know what to cook for dinner. All I know is what's in my refrigerator. I don't want to go to the store. So a thing that AI can do is you can put that information in the AI and ask it to give you a recipe. And this is something I think that is very, very different than what you can currently do on the internet with traditional search. You can certainly go through and manually scan recipes and be like, okay, well, um, I can't make that, or, or this is close, but I need to make a substitution. But you can't do something personalized to your situation in the same way. The internet just isn't organized for it. The information is there. In theory, you just can't access it. And so this is, this is um, just something I like to think about as an interesting way to sort of shift how we access that information and how we can make it more useful for our individual circumstances. Great. But that recipe may or may not be good. <laughs> like, you will get a very believable recipe, but I just, like... I would do want to raise one other point here, which is that, like, we are dealing with an extraordinarily general thing, and that's about to move to a more specific thing, right? So every single company that is now, like, we're doing a GPT-4 thing, they're going to take your existing data and in some way, I mean, they're not going to tune the models until it's really cheap to do later, but they'll at least have some type of information, like embedding something for it to refer to, because the models respond based upon your prompt, right? Like you type the prompt in whatever way, and it reduces the probability of stuff that it should say to you to like a slice of that, 
right? And so having different aspects to it, having different pieces of data it can access will change it dramatically. Now, each of these companies is also gonna have their own custom LLM or their tuned LLM that functions, again, goes one, right now you have kind of like a spectacular intern, right? GPT-4 is like the best intern you've ever had that can do anything pretty decent, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't, but it like can't use the internet unless you use plugins, right? So it might just make stuff up all the time. However, it's already plugged into the internet, right? Like all these things are already kind of being solved on the, you know, the, is it using information from 2021, whatever. But we're gonna move to the stage of it's all the interconnection, it's all the customization. That's gonna remove some of these concerns but raise new ones. First of all, National Air Research Resource. <laughs> Second of all, is it, I mean, one of the important factors of democratization, I, I would say that there are two really critical factors in why democratization is important from both like research and implementation and like a societal basis. First of all, even if you don't care about people at all, our AI is gonna be worse, right? So if you don't have a soul, if you're a sociopath, and you don't care about anything except for that, like your AI is gonna be worse, so good. Tuck that away. Second thing is, it's the contextual application, right? If you drop one thing in one town with one set of circumstances and one thing in another town, and I'm talking more about like narrow, you know, deep learning AI in this in this case, but the large language models have the same uh, like implications in terms of the kind of cutoff probability thing. But if you do not have that broad, broad base of testing, of research, of things that are not explicitly commercially valuable, you're gonna fall into some random hole you didn't know was gonna happen, right? And again, it's because you're working with a 650 billion point probability cloud, right? Now, I think some of the folks that are like, it's just gonna randomly wake up and do some stuff, or there's these black swan scenarios that we can kind of thought experiment but have no way to put probabilities on themselves and likelihoods, I think that that's a less constructive focus of energy than things that we know will fairly likely go wrong. Um, and when we talk about things like like licensing or like having uh, like having regulatory mechanisms, one of my great concerns is that we do not have the research and the knowledge to actually effectively know how those processes should work outside of governance mechanisms, which are very important and a great starting place, right? Uh, but from a technological perspective, we just have a crazy amount of research to do and a crazy amount of translational research, which is novel, but fortunately we have the mechanisms to do that now. So if I was gonna say one policy intervention, um, I would say take very seriously the narrative, like the related stuff, right? Broad-based testing, which can also be a learning exercise, which we have AIRedTeam.org, check it out. Um, but that's a, that's a really key thing. Like fund the stuff we already have in place when you're looking at licensing stuff, at least make sure that it's gonna bring some transferable governance things to other people and doesn't just apply to a small subsection. Uh, and then finally, do not forget that it's just people. It's always people. It's not the AI doing something crazy. If some, you know, if some insane thing happens where an AI tries to do it in these black swans, it's gonna make a pandemic. It's not gonna be because the AI decided it was a good idea. It's gonna be because somebody was being like a terrorist and tried to make it do that, right? So I think it's extremely important that we separate from this idea that AI is gonna become self-directed as like priority one. Again, AI could certainly do that. It would be because a human hacked together a system that had an objective and a bunch of different models working together, plugged into a bunch of stuff on the internet. So if you're concerned about that, that concern should always be associated with people. Uh, well, for those of you who are paying attention last week, this may sound a little repetitive, but, but as a company, I think we've been pretty forward uh, on our policy ideas for how to, to regulate AI, and um, our CEO has been out there talking about these ideas. So despite Austin's skepticism of, of, of this idea, um, I think the idea we've put forth is the idea that at least a subset of very, very capable models, um, generative AI models, should be licensed. That licensing is a means to an end, because what we're really interested is making sure that the AI developers are putting in place a set of safety practices that include evaluations of capabilities, evaluations of emergent capabilities, red teaming processes, external validation and testing. Um, we do a lot of that. We, we are making our best guesses at what some of that should be. Um, and, and what we are hoping to work with governments is 
to figure out a mechanism to improve that and, and make sure that we're doing the right thing. So the ideas we laid forth are a licensing mechanism, a mechanism for creating the appropriate set of evaluations and standards um, driven by a multi-stakeholder process to ensure that it could reflect and be updated uh, in line with developments in the technology, and then a some sort of global agreement or um, global angle to this to make sure that whatever we do in the US, um, that, that will only touch US models. And I think if we're really worried about the implications of AI, then it needs to touch all AI models. And so there needs to be a global angle to this, um, this type of regulatory or um, <coughs> governance. I'm glad you did that because now we can have a fun conversation. Okay, so I will say first of all, I do generally agree with that as like a frame, you know, here's several things that need to happen in some meaningful way. I think my issue or like my lack of enthusiasm for licensing uh, would be primarily based on there's just gonna be this massive amount of non just like commercially deployed models, right? Like the open source world's gonna continue. And that's why I, I like the governance things and the things that are learned from that process. I think to what you're saying are going to be, in my mind, the most most immediately impactful thing, right? Like people thinking that they're going to have to do licenses in the immediate term is almost more useful than that mechanism being immediately put on it because everybody has to evaluate their governance systems, right? Like what they're doing to at least like have good faith, we're doing our best, you know. But um, from my perspective, the most important again, the most important aspect from that is almost the transferability of it. Right, for anybody that's making an open source product to be able to adopt similar, if, there, if it is like guardrails technology or if it is governance mechanisms or testing protocols or systems, all of those things, like letting the ecosystem develop, like having, supporting the development of the ecosystem of kind of like assurance and testing. I mean, again, part of what I found immediately when we announced the red team thing that we're doing together at DEF CON is that none of it exists almost at that, right? There's like very little mechanism for these types of exercises at scale, and even not at scale, like at a certain scale, right? Because this work is done as a general matter, you know, through the dev process or whatever. And we're just now at the point where it's touching consumers, and consumers are using it regularly, so it's valuable to have that access. So again, credit to you guys, everybody else. We had all the folks sign on across the both like uh, commercial side and the open source big picture side, but that's what it kind of has to be, right? Everybody working together with the things that they specifically know are either open concerns. And again, most of this is gonna live at the application level, right? Most of this is gonna live, like most of the conversations I have are folks coming in and being like, hey, we see how this could be extremely useful for people, but we're not sure if we should do it right now, right? And so one of the things I really recommended, and again, as a you know, governance mechanism, something we should do is if you're not sure, just try to re like research it with people and test it with people. Right, like just figure out who it is likely to benefit and adversely impact, and then find like a reputable university, and then make sure it actually serves the folks that you're intending to serve, or at least like some similar archetypal scenario in terms of like need, application, whatever. Um, but that's like your safe way forward. Again, even if you don't care, it's a safer way, lower risk way. But you're gonna have better technology, you're gonna have people more engaged. And I think that there's like a very real sense that in a time, like people feel like they should have more power now. And it's not gonna be obvious until somebody tries to shut it down and take it away once we're like one step further in, in terms of its functionality and um, like interoperability with the other services that you have. But <laughs> if you do not allow for folks to not feel that way, it's gonna be really scary, right? And like I'm gonna be pissed off too, you know? But I think that we, that's one thing we'll walk into and not understand that we're walking into until it's too late. Great. Yeah, I'd love to give you the opportunity to jump in on this very big idea, big conversation as well. For sure, thank you. Um, I was uh, frantically Googling to know about uh, because I think that, you know, building off of some of the things that Austin has shared, the, this reality that like these systems are interacting uh, with each other in the real world by people, right? Like these systems behind the scenes are piloted by or <laughs> used by People, and that means that we need to study how these systems interact with people and how people change their behavior. I think one of the great frustrations that I had working in the policy space on the Hill was that advocacy groups would come to me 
with some recommendation, oh, if we make this thing illegal or if we incentivize this, then behavior will change without thinking like two therefores down the road of like, okay, well, and then people will adapt to that new status quo and they will have this new form of behavior and therefore, you know, this new outcome might come to um, take place. So I think the, the emphasis on, you know, testing and trying to sandbox where possible is really powerful. I also think that this is something that we built into the Algorithmic Accountability Act was like, nobody knows. Nobody knows what the best way to measure these tools are. Nobody knows what uh, the right threshold of like how much accuracy to the data set a system ought to have in trade-off with other uh, variables that might be measurable. Nobody knows which things we aren't measuring yet that maybe we will come back and look at and realize like, oh wow, there are really interesting network effects here. There are really interesting interactions between different ensemble models that create these weirdo feedback loops. So I think that certainly a strong emphasis on testing is really valuable. I also think that uh, there is, as much as I understand a lot of the arguments in favor of the licensing approach, there is a really strong um, regulatory capture concern that I hold. I think that uh, while I want everyone who is developing these tools to do so with uh, concern and with care, I also think that, um, you know, I live in the United States of America where we have like a goof a doof healthcare system in part because of regulatory capture. And like, I don't wanna see that happening here. There are some really big players. It does take a lot of um, resources sometimes to build some of these systems. That is already a threshold that's really tough. And then having this additional layer of regulatory capture to me raises some red, red flags. So while I do think that there should be mandates for greater testing and transparency, um, both what goes into these systems in terms of data sets and um, training practices, as well as monitoring of the outputs and how these systems work in the world, I'm wary of uh, certain thresholds being used for defining um, kind of a set of players that are kind of allowed to play in this space. The other thing that I'll add to that is that I think that, you know, coming back to this idea that it is all people, it's really important to recognize like where these tools are actually being used. Um, with generative AI, we're in the very, very early days. And, you know, to Alex's point, it, that's really exciting. Like, oh my gosh, there are so many funky dunky ways that people are gonna glue these things together and come up with new stuff. Right, like even for a lot of folks who were working in the space, the idea of generating computer code was like, oh dang, yeah, like wow, language, I hadn't thought about it that way before. Um, and so I think that there are a lot of really exciting things that are going to come out of those interactions, but it is also the case that um, there needs to be a better understanding, I think, from a policy making context in terms of where are these tools actually being used? What systems are they actually being built into? And how can, you know, whether it be consumers themselves, but let's be real, like how many of us read terms of service, but uh, organizations that serve on behalf of consumers um, to actually understand what's under the hood because a lot of these systems are being white labeled in ways that are kind of unintuitive to people behind the scenes, um, who aren't behind the scenes, to know which parts of our lives are actually relying on um, generative or other AI systems um, to function. hallucinations as like a primary concern because two things first of all it's just like uh, your best intern ever making up something based on their like connection to something else so it's not really hallucinations it's just them being confidently wrong the second thing is this is so call it bullshit. yeah yeah or you yeah I don't know being, being wrong yeah <laughs> just being wrong would be cool but I think that ultimately uh, because I mean if you use Bing right if you use the different tools it's not gonna be right all the time, but at least it's getting better at like, here's what, when we search the internet, when it happens, all the plugins, you have Wolfram Alpha plugged into ChatGPT now, so all your mathematical, the stupid mathematical stuff it does, now is being adjusted by Wolfram Alpha. So I think uh, it's like, we gotta stop getting stuck in time, like every two days some stuff changes, right? Like every two days some stuff changes. I get stuck on some other topic for two or three days, and whatever I said would be cool, two days before that has just already happened and been forked twice. Right? And so whatever way we have to do to make folks understand that and not get stuck in stuff is critically important. That's three minutes, that's great. Um, so I, um, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when, when Photoshop became really powerful 
And um, I remember a very similar debate happening back then about, well, how are we going to know whether an image is real um, when there's these, power, these powerful tools out there? And, and you know, I think what we've seen now in hindsight is that we just kind of got used to it, and we, we, we are more skeptical consumers, and we, we've learned to sort of just understand that, like, look, there are these tools out there that mean that's things that we look at. We can't necessarily rely on it 100%. We've been living with Photoshop for a good long time. So I, I think that um, sometimes I want to tell people, like, let's take a deep breath. Like, deep fakes are a problem. That's something we should be concerned about. Let's not, like, let, let, let's not ignore the problem. But also, let's, like, give the American consumers a little bit of faith that they will kind of learn as we've come to learn, come to live with these tools for a good amount of time. We've only, really only, like, eight months into the world of generative AI. Once we've lived with these tools for a little while, that we'll just, it'll, we'll just get used to it. And it'll, it'll, we'll, we'll be able to live with them and, and understand. Um, how to, how to use them and, and how, to, how to be sort of smart media consumer, put it that way. Like, all right, I got one thing to say about fix though. I feel like it's actually maybe going to be positive for some sections of society to stop trusting everything they see. I was always kind of annoyed even when it first started because I'm like, it doesn't require that. Humans love believing the thing they want to believe, right? So my grand, I remember, I remember like my great aunt or something shared the Obama wears the Muslim ring and it was like literally the one ring from the, you know, and it just like had 50,000 likes and everybody's looking at it, you know? So I brought this point up at a uh, like staff deal one time and everybody was annoyed at me on the panel. Like, what do you want us to do to fix society? Like, I don't know, kind of, <laughs> right? Like, I don't, I'm not telling you to legislate and fix society, but like, let's just start and be like, I don't know, this is the thing we got to think about, care about, and we don't do propagandas. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man, I can't believe I said that. But you know what I mean? Like, so what do we do? Question mark. Well, I almost try to do it. Uh, oh, and by the way, the testing and playing with stuff with your hands on, that's the best way to do it. I think it's an easy trap to follow to, but I think a lot of people still think, when they think about generative AI, that the AI is looking stuff up in its data set. And I want to emphasize, it is learning from that data set, but what what comes out of it is is something much smaller than the data that it's trained on, and it is does not have access to that data set. And I think, again, the reason that's important is not because mechanically it's super important to know, but because it has implications for how you think about what it's doing and what it's good at and what it isn't good at. I've, uh, building on that, I've, I've seen people say things like, ChatGPT has admitted that this is, you know, uh, what it like learned this from, or, or this or that about when people try to ask it questions about its capacities. Alec, is that is does that go along with that same idea in terms of it's not really actually capable of like doing that kind of self-referencing and explaining what its, you know, internal sources were or what is actually in its data set because it doesn't have the direct ability to query that. Would that be right? Pretty much. I mean, it, it, it answers that like anything else. It's not like it, it knows specifically that you are asking it some self-referential question. It just treats it like any other text, and it answers it like other similar pieces of text without necessarily specifying or, or thinking that there's anything uniquely uh, unique about that that requires like a unique type of answer. Great. B, myths, misconceptions. Thanks, yeah, I, I think that the main myth that I would really like to counter is the idea that it isn't people behind the scenes. Uh, there are so many people behind the scenes, both in curating and labeling these data sets, but in building these powerful models, as well as creating the use cases that they're applied in. I think you know part of why in algorithmic accountability we approach things as critical decisions rather than critical systems was because you can have a super screwed up decision making process and you throw some automation at it and now it's like a way faster screwed up decision making process, right? Like we have to interrogate, you know, like make society better. Like we have to actually ask the question like are we doing the, are we doing a good thing here? Um, so I think that's one myth. Another myth, I, something, this is not necessarily a myth, but it's something and actually I really appreciate some of the phrasing that Alec has here, here is that um, I think early on in discussion of these technologies, um, there was a, the, the name LLM, large language model, 
And um, something that has been really wonderful that I've seen pushback on is like they are large text models. They're great for generating text, but actually there are like lots of languages that aren't represented in text, including ASL. Um, here in BC, we have you know fabulous folks at Gallaudet like University doing incredible work there. And like I think that you know that's one like small language tweak that I think we could all make to not overrepresent what these systems are doing. And then the third thing that I would say in terms of myths to debunk, and this is actually something, speaking of our IBM days, uh, when I worked at IBM, there was this uh, great myth that IBM would tell about augmented intelligence, right? Where this, is a, this isn't about replacing people, this is about empowering people with technology, and some of you may have seen uh, the recent news of IBM being like, oh, we're gonna like, replace a bunch of HR people with uh, automated systems. Um, and, and I was literally in meetings at IBM where, you know, it, us idealistic young IBMers were like, it's about augmented intelligence. And clients were like, well, I want that. Like, I want to replace people. Like, tell me why. <laughs> like, I, I'm trying to save money here, right? And like, I do think that a myth that we have around technology is that, um, you know, oh, it's going to create a bunch of jobs and therefore it's like going to be fine for people. Um, and it is true that a lot of technological tools, we we'll talk among them, have created so many new opportunities and so many professions that didn't exist 50 years ago. It's wild and inspiring. And also, like, the process in the meantime has sucked really bad for a lot of people. And so another myth as we think about the power and the capability of these technologies is this idea that, like, oh, these are not substituting uh, human tasks or skills and therefore won't lead to labor disruptions. I think we should really challenge that. I don't think that it means that we're necessarily automating people's uh, entire work, but there's a, a, great, um, a great article that, I'm, the name is escaping me, but it coins the term faux-tomation, like fake automation. And, right, there are so many times where we introduce a technology and it may make some parts of a process better, but it also may make some parts of a process worse and it's not always uh, just because you introduce technology into something and just because it makes it faster or uh, you know, like less uh, expensive or whatever. That doesn't actually mean that the, the experience of it is better. I personally like checking out with the human cashier, uh, my, my little rebellion against uh, the photomation of our systems. But I think that uh, when you standardize things, when you automate things, when you uh, build systems around things, that does have real implications for the humans that are doing those tasks today. And that's not to say that we necessarily shouldn't do those things, but we ought to think about what's gonna happen and how people are going to be able to adjust to those changes and whether or not the new awesome exciting you know web developer roles that came out of uh, all of these technologies are actually uh, for instance going to the people who were working in the newsrooms or whatever other um, the case may be that is uh, you know uh, being disrupted by those technologies as well. I mean I think the same also what's up Amy? I think the same fundamental principle applies, which is just like, you have to make some type of partnership to, I mean, first of all, I think just any, any kind of natural investment in what folks are already trying to do, right? Because there are a lot of people that are working on things already. And I think there's kind of a presumptuousness that there's like some type of limited progress, right? In emerging markets. Um, but I think going in and looking at, okay, how can we make kind of like multilateral or bilateral kind of research work that does help provide resources for some of the aspects that are going to be more difficult, especially around some safety stuff. Um, but I think the support is about understanding, like, I mean, the example is kind of terrible, but it's the one I think of all the time, which is like, there was a, the justification for the investment in rural communities and building some rural broadband was the fact that a contested environment is like that in wartime environments. There's a reason that, and the military funds a bunch of stuff, but I think the flip is not that, but something like it, you know? I think it's the need to find like joint interests, joint needs. And then from the perspective of just like international development entities at all, I mean, I think it's just acknowledging that there is a lot of progress to be invested in and grown. Oh, and there are like some awesome research institutions popping up that companies are anchoring. And I think part of it is also demonstrating the value and having information together that shows like, here's why you should do this. You have to make it kind of turnkey for people to do something good a lot of times. Anyone else want to jump in on this one or we have, we could have one more question. I'll just jump in really quick on that. Um, so one, I think that the labor disruption conversation is actually really like central to 
uh, a lot of the, the like parts of the world who have been, have been on the receiving end of a lot of these technologies historically, like it, it's not a great outlook. Um, and I think that there's a lot more value and, and need for a lot more conversation about like which tasks and which roles are facing um, disruption in this space. I also think from the development perspective, you know, we've all heard about like, there's been a, a big push for like a pause on advanced AI research or whatever. And I know that there's like a bajillion interpretations of that, but I actually think like there's a lot of research work to be done. Uh, there's a lot of need uh, for pushing the boundaries of what are considered low resource languages. So resource languages that don't have like tons and tons and tons of data online already. And there's some really fascinating work happening across the African continent because of the wealth of languages that exist in that space to really push the boundaries in terms of what capabilities are for lower data like reliant systems. And so I think that part of what maybe we need to do is also reframe some of these spaces. While certainly, you know, I was when I was working at IBM, we were working with folks who, you know, having their data center be constantly powered was a big challenge. And so it's not to like uh, discount the, the real concrete uh, infrastructure challenges that people face. But also, I think that there are real opportunities when we reframe those problems as like, these are the cutting edge AI research questions that we have. And those folks who are doing that leading AI research in many of these spaces are the people who kind of have the, they have the wealth of knowledge to give to these spaces. And they are working because, you know, it's like writing great poetry, like sometimes having constraints leads you to greater uh, creativity and problem solving. And I think that in these spaces, we would do well to honor um, the challenges that those problems present and make them kind of the frontline leader um, challenges that we as an AI community say, hey, actually, we want to really work in this space and, and work on these issues. Yeah. So the first thing I would say is that ChatGPT is like a different type of technology with a different purpose. It's really likely that you'll probably have some meta layer of some chatbot with other little checking things that accesses deep learning, traditional narrow AIs. Um, but I think that that's, I think you're gonna see the added layer of specialization. I think you saw Reddit close their API and everybody that has sources of data is now saying, I think to the question about copyright, it's now, ironically, to Mr. Nelson's point here, getting more oily suddenly because it's easier to monetize in that way, but that's still for the people that hold the third party data, right? So that's not gonna change, and I think perhaps if anything, it's likely that the open source community, I mean to the point of necessity, the open source community's desire to be able to remove the hardware barrier has just dropped it down lower and lower and lower, right? I think you're gonna see something similar with open source LLMs that are specialized, um, but they're gonna be different verticals. They're gonna be interconnected with different types of things. And actually, I think you're gonna see kind of like gov like kind of governing things that are bouncing back and forth between some type of check the LLM and some narrow AI. Um, so the big competition concern that I have is in proposals to try to, for, to, to, the, to the question of does, is data the new oil should it be paid for, is if you, if you do require payment for it, that it'll make it impossible uh, for any upstart to get into the business. Because when you're talking about billions and billions of pieces of data, content, you know, and anything that gives any sort of reasonable compensation to anybody is gonna you know, just do the math. One penny times billions and billions is a lot of money. And so um, that's a real concern in this space is that if, if you try to impose some sort of licensing whether that's because of copyright or anything else, then, then you will end up in a world where only the wealthiest companies, or even if, the, if, if them at all, can, can afford to do it. I think what might end up happening is that you end up, uh, these, these models end up getting developed in other countries uh, where, which have more permissive copyright regimes. I know Japan has a very permissive law permitting training of AI models. Um, I don't think as, as you know, as policymakers here in the U.S. should really want that result. Um, so that that so assuming that we end up assuming that we have a world that you know recognizes that training of AI models is fair use under copyright law um, and does not require licensing, then I think it's open to a lot of to, to a lot of companies to try to build their own models um, because they're a, they're able to access the same amount of the same data that everyone else is. I want to challenge that a little bit. I'm not to challenge.
challenge the idea. I do think that there's a real risk of uh, a push toward enclosing what has historically kind of been uh, public knowledge, ironically, um, right? Like uh, there, there is there is this really wonderful thing that is our information commons that is like the knowledge that we as humanity kind of like share amongst each other out in the open. And I do see, I share the concern around like what it looks like to enclose that and what it looks like to, um, you know, permission it under frankly kind of archaic systems of intellectual property. That being said, even without that, the barriers are tremendous, right? Like just having access to the, like theoretically I could look at all the pages on the internet, but can I actually look at all the pages on the internet? No, I will die first, right? Like the reality is that to have the kind of compute systems to do this type of analysis is still a tremendous barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. And it's part of why, you know, I think that there are, there is a lot of value in having these kind of resources made available with more intentional kind of competition frames. But like, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that this isn't really expensive, right? Like I've known people who worked at like, in past lives, uh, companies that provide cloud computing and there are massive battles and bidding wars happening inside of those organizations between developing companies who are just fighting over raw compute resources. So like, while, while it is true that like, maybe keeping information out <coughs> in the open provides some opportunity until we move toward architectures that favor those kind of like low resource, uh, low intensity training methodologies, the reality is like the game is still going to be played by big money. And so I think that like there might be a role for public models in that space. There's like a lot of open questions here about how to address that, but like we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that just because information is open that means that everyone's on an equal playing field when like access to compute itself is still such a precious thing. I don't know. There's like there are a lot of like tiny tiny companies out